Today is December 13th, 2020, the second Sunday where we're looking at messages on Christmas, on the incarnation of Jesus Christ. We're looking at the prologue of the Gospel of John. That's in modern, modern parlance at the introduction the opening paragraphs. That's how they did things in Greek literature. There was a prologue. Jesus, the divine word, became flesh. That is the essence of these first 18 verses, John 1, 1 through 18. If you want to be able to identify a group as to whether they are Christian or not, it's not their morality, it's not their use of the cross, it's not their denominational name, it's one simple thing. It's the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. If someone claims to be Christian but doesn't believe in the deity of Jesus Christ, they are imposters. They are phonies. They are wolves in sheep's clothing. Because the divinity of Jesus Christ is the one non-negotiable element of the Christian faith. The prologue doesn't just present a hope. It presents that this message is the only hope for the world. That's how essential, that's how relevant the message of Christmas is to every person of every generation. In the 1800s, there was a great missionary movement in the UK, in the, the British Empire at that time. They were sending missionaries to China, to parts of Africa, to the United States, everywhere. And one place that they went was India. William Carey was the one who really got this missionary movement afoot in the 1800s. And now, two centuries later, when a missionary who has been in the field in Asia for the last 40 years returns home, he writes a book, the title of which is Foolishness to the Greeks, The Gospel and Western Culture. See, Newbegin had spent 40 years away from England, but when he returned, he discovered a culture that was alien to the gospel. And anything about the gospel, they were modern in their thinking, which sound, made God sound like foolishness. So much so that it was very similar to what Paul experienced in the, the city of Corinth and expressed in the book of the First Corinthians. See, what Western culture used to be Christian. It used to have a theological centrality to thought that God was central. We see this in the 
founding documents of our country. But today, Western culture has uh, forgotten about God and his role in running the universe. It's perceived today that it's science that runs everything. And knowing science is all important. And there was another domain, not just the external world, the inner life was a domain of, of God, of good and evil. And now that is perceived to be psychological. We, we live in a material world that doesn't seek God, it sees science and psychology and everything. And to this same kind of culture, John writes the prologue to the book of John, the Gospel of John. John 1.1 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. These are all vital verses. Jesus Christ, who is the Word, was with God in the beginning. He's always been divine. He was with God in the beginning. He's not a created being. And through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Very basic, vital understandings of who Jesus Christ is. Verse 4, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind, all humanity. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That light is so bright that darkness can't defeat it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Jesus, from the very beginning of this book, is presented as the light of the world. He's not a light. He is the light of the world. He is the hope. He is the one source of light that can drive out darkness. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, he was in it and he made everything, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was not, which was his own, but his own did not receive him. They rejected him. Right at the very prologue of John, you were going to see that Jesus is rejected. He is the light of the world, but they have rejected that light of the world. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. He has allowed people, if they trust God, to become children of God. 
children, <clears throat> verse 13, not of natural descent, not by heredity, not by genetics. You can't find this ancestry on 23 and me. Not born of natural descent, nor of human decision. You can't decide to be born in this way. It's not a matter of another person's will, a husband's will, but these people are born of God. The whole idea of being born again is in the prologue to the book of John. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son. See, God revealed himself to Moses, and it lit up his face, the Shekinah glory of God. And in the tabernacle, the Shekinah glory, the presence of God was there. It tinted, was in that tent. Then it was in the tabernacle. And now the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. He tented, he dwelt with his people. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, and what's inside of him? Grace and truth. He's not judgmental. He's understanding. He gives grace to those who do not deserve it. And he always speaks the truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. John the Baptist was born six months before Jesus. But John the Baptist says, Jesus has always existed. He was before me. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace. Anybody who has received the grace of God, it's because of Jesus Christ and what he did. In place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through the Anointed One, Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Chapter 1. See, this was a common feature in ancient literature to introduce the main themes, the main characters of a biography or a story and make the reader be aware of issues and the forces that are going to be in the preceding work. And he tells us that there was never a time, never a time, that the Son did not exist. He was always with God. And he was in together working with God to make and create everything. So he could not have been made. He has always existed. And this is how he is going to act on behalf of all humanity. This 
brief prologue is it shows the, the depth and the fullness of the Christian truth. That the infinite God became a man in the person of Jesus Christ. See, he's re, re, repeatedly using this theme throughout the book. Jesus is always portrayed as the divine one. He uses the divine name. Where did the divine name come from? In Exodus, Moses went on the mountain and said, Who do I say sent me? I am that I am. And Jesus uses this name over and over again about himself. 4, verse 26, 8, verse 24, and 28, and 58, 13, 18. In 1030, he claimed to be the one in nature and the essence with the Father, so much so that the unbelieving Jews recognized this claim of deity, and they began to condemn him. And Jesus did not correct Thomas when he fell on his knees after the resurrection and exclaimed, My Lord and my God. In fact, he praised him for his faith. See, Jesus' reaction is broken if he was not God. But he was God. And the rest of the New Testament, that is the theme. In Colossians, he, for in him all of the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. In Colossians 2.9. Romans 9.5 refers to Christ as God, blessed forever. Titus 2.13 and 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, call him our God and our Savior. God the Father addresses the Son as God in Hebrews 1.8. Your throne, O God, is forever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. In John 12.40, John quotes Isaiah. 6.10, a passage in which Isaiah's vision refers to God. Jeremiah the prophet said that the Messiah would be called the Lord, our righteousness. The Messiah would be called the Lord, Yahweh, our righteousness. See, God and Jesus are both called shepherd in Psalms uh, 23 1 John 10 14 and the Holy One in Isaiah 10 20 and Psalm 16 10 Jesus Christ possesses the end the, the qualities the unique qualities that only God have he reveals Christ to be eternal, omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He doesn't change. He's immutable. He's sovereign. Jesus Christ does the works that only God can do. He created all things. He sustains the creation. He raises the dead. He forgives sin. And his word stands forever. And he received worship. Jesus Christ is ex the externally, eternally present word. And he has come to earth to communicate with us. All things came into being through him. And apart from him, 
nothing came into being that has come into being. See, those who say that he is the first creation of God or some other thing that's outside of Scripture are heretics. They've been that way since the second and third centuries. The truth is that Jesus is the incarnate, the fleshed out God on earth. And in him was life. The life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. He is the source of hope. He is the source of truth. And he overcomes darkness. Jesus is no mere mortal, no great philosopher. He was not an inspired carpenter or a model human. He was God himself, taking on the clothing of humanity, embracing it and speaking through it and delivering the reality of God to a world. He is God in the flesh. Christ is God, and he is revealing himself to men. Reaching into the realm of men and women, he takes their form in order to give an exhaustive and certain revelation of who he is. See, Jesus is God's intervention into a troubled world. The world has been broken for millennia. And at just the right time, he sent Jesus and the flesh to die for the sins of the world. And some people reject Christ, but they are rejecting salvation if they reject him. He is the truth. He is the light. He is the hope. See, humanity is, is broken. Sin is not a series of bad choices, but a state of being from which Bad choices continually come. This is true on an individual level. This is true in a family level. It's true in a national level, but it's true also in a global level. We are fallen. And we can't get up. Only Christ can lift us up, can give us the light. He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. He is the only hope. He is the source of joy, the source of light. He became he was changed into, egenito is the Greek word, it's like a caterpillar is changed into a butterfly and therefore ceases to be a caterpillar. He's totally changed. It's a wonder. He can change and be completely changed. And he's permanently changed. He's not going to revert back into God and lose his humanity. Jesus Christ is permanently the God-man. And he will be through all eternity. 
as we see in the book of Revelation. The words of the 5th century church father, Cyril of Alexandria, we do not assert that there are any change in the nature of the word when it became flesh, or that it was transformed into an entire man, consisting of a soul and body, but we say that the word, in a manner indescribable and inconceivable, united personally to himself, flesh animated with a reasonable soul, and thus became man, and was called the son of man. The natures which were brought together to form a true unity were different, but out of both is one Christ and one Son. We do not mean that the difference of the natures is annihilated by reason of this union, but rather that the deity and manhood, by their inexpressible and inexplicable concurrence into unity, have produced for us the one Lord and Son, Jesus Christ. Paul wrote of the Incarnation, By common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. 1 Timothy 3.16 These This concept is so amazing that Charles Wesley captured the, the wonder of all this in the Incarnation in his song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. You know the words, but listen to them again. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. Pleased as men, as man, with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. See, this idea of dwelling with us started in the book of Genesis. God was with man and Adam and Eve in the garden. And he is going, he came to earth, and throughout all eternity, he is going to dwell or tent or live with man. We see this in the book of Revelation. John writes, Behold the tabernacle of God, the dwelling place of God, that's where God lives, is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no longer any death, there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain, the first things have passed away. Jesus himself warned, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So those who think that they're worshiping God, but are ignorant of or reject the fullness of the New Testament teaching about Christ are deceived because he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him, John 5, 23. And also he said, whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also.
Jesus is God's intervention into the world, and he has given you and I hope beyond anything we can imagine. Sin is not a series of bad choices, but a state of being from which bad choices continually come. See, we need Jesus Christ. We need to be changed. Humanity must be reborn. It needs an absolute transformation. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. See, the message is that God came to earth to bring light, to bring grace and truth, and to call people to faith, to call people to change, to call people to hope. And it is available to each and every individual around the globe. It is the true universal faith. And we will see, as it shows us in the book of Revelation, people from every na language, nation, and tongue praising God in heaven. Those who love him, those who have faith in him, will be his children, now and forevermore. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, for those here who don't know you, may they find faith. May they turn to the light that, that obliterates darkness. May they have faith May they be received as children of God by faith, by God's grace and truth that was given through the Messiah, the God-man. Dear Lord, we thank you, and may we share this hope and truth with those we know and love. In Christ's name we pray, amen.